So I want to start by saying that as far as I'm concerned, this is a conversation, not a lecture. So if you have questions or if you want to know more about what I'm talking about or other things come up for you, by all means, let me know because I would much prefer to have it work that way. The other thing that I have to say in full disclosure is that I am completely 100% over the top in love with my profession, with psychology, with what we get to do, with the people we get to meet. So I come with incredible bias <laughs> that I have to own right from the start. The other thing that I want to own about this process is that I'm one of those people who really wanted to be in the rooms with people. And so the one area that I don't have any real experience in that is a regret is research. I would love to be more involved in research at some point, but you will not hear me talk about research with my degree. But one of the things that I was asked to do was to talk about the different psychology-related careers and pathways that can be available to you. And so I thought that what I would do is run through with you what I have done with my marriage and family therapist license and with my psychology degree. Um, only because some people get in the career, they get their job, they stay there, and they do that for a really long time. And then there are other people like me who are ridiculously curious and want to learn as much as they can. And um, I've done a little bit of absolutely anything I think you could possibly do with a licensed marriage and family therapist license and with a psychology degree. So I thought it was a way to give you an idea of some of the things that you can do. The other thing is that I've been lucky enough to do this since way back when in the day. And so that will also give you some idea of what a career can look like over the course of a lifetime. I started this in my 20s. I get to be 56 this year in November. I love, love, love everything that I had the opportunity to learn. I have burnt out once in a phenomenal way. I'll tell you a little bit about that. I think it comes with our work. I think what we learn to do is to really honor the fact that all the experiences we have are cumulative. And what we have to learn along the way, if we want to do this for any length of time, is how do we take care of ourselves in the process. So that's something else that I might be able to talk about depending on the time. I'm going to talk really fast. If you need me to slow down, let me know. I wore my professional slipper shoes so that I could stay relaxed. Um, I actually love talking to people, but when I have to stand up in front of people, it freaks me out. So um, just know that. So I graduated with a BS in psychology from UC Santa Cruz in 1982. Love Santa Cruz. That's a whole bunch of other stories we could do, but we'll do that later. So the first thing that I did was I worked as a weekend supervisor in the Baton Women's Shelter. And what was so amazing about that experience was that I got to actually live with those women and their children. And I got to learn in a real life, living with them kind of way, what some of the impacts were of having been in violent relationships. And what some of the struggles are in terms of even being able to envision that there's something possible outside of that experience. So I found for me that some of the residential experiences I did were incredibly helpful because not only did I get to have a cognitive and intellectual experience with what I was learning, but I got to have a felt experience. And you're going to hear me talk a lot about intellectual cognitive process and then felt process. And I think residential experiences give us a great lens to see what life feels like when things aren't going the way we want them to go. So I did that from 82 to 83, and then I transitioned to a job at a place called Child Health USA. So it's a residential treatment program in Southern California. At that time, they had eight cottages. And the children who were coming to live there were children who had been severely abused and neglected. They had failed a number of foster care placements. And at that time, the idea was that if they couldn't figure out how to be successful in our program, they were going to the state hospital. 
So everything was at stake. And the idea was, we're going to put about eight kids to a cottage, and we're going to staff it with two or three staff, and we're going to teach them how to have relationships with people and regulate their emotions and cross that intimacy barrier that Dr. Perry talks about so that they learn there are some trustworthy adults in the world. And then we're going to set them up to be experienced to, to be successful when they go back to foster care. Some of that actually happened. Some of my most humbling experiences as a therapist also happened. You're going to hear me talk about co-regulation, which is what happens when two people get in a room with one another, and how we feel has an impact on how that other person feels, and how they feel on us. You put two fairly self-regulated adults in a cottage with eight children who are fully and completely in their fight, flight, freeze response most of the time. And it is an incredible experience. I lasted two years in that ex excuse me, in that experience. And there were a couple of things that happened for me. Lots of positive, but the other thing that happened was it was the first time I asked myself, is it possible for a person to get broken and not be able to get them? And I felt like I had betrayed my whole profession by even asking that question because I feel like I had definitely been taught that there is no such thing as not being able to help a person that with the right strategies or the right relationship or the right whatever, everyone can be helped. And I worked with one child in particular who did end up going to the state hospital. And um, it took me a long time to come to terms with that experience. Uh, it took a lot of soul searching for those of us who had worked with that child, wondering if somehow we hadn't done our jobs trying to figure out what kind of meaning to give to that experience. And so um, I just offer that because we do have this, this bias and this pressure that we put on ourselves as mental health professionals to be all that, always, to every single person we work with. And I guess I don't know, even to this day, if any of us have that kind of power. One of my prior students, a woman named Mao, got me one of those um, superwoman bracelets, which I thought was hysterical. And I really wanted to wear it tonight, and I forgot it. But what I appreciate about it is that it makes me remember I'm so not that. And I would love, in this talk, for that to be one of the things that you remember. If you decide to go into this field and do this work, you get to bring your very best and do your very best with every skill you learn. And you get to know that there's also a piece of mystery about the outcome that has nothing to do with you. And I think that's just honoring that there are other influences that exist in life around us that are bigger than us and that also intervene. And so I think it also helps us with staying humble and thinking we know everything. I know it's a cliche, but for me, I feel like every single day when I'm sitting with a client, I'm learning something I didn't know before I had the conversation with them. And that's part of what keeps the job so exciting. Um, then from 85 to 87, I worked as a domestic violence outreach counselor in Riverside. So I worked with law enforcement, and I went on domestic violence calls, and with clergy, and with businesses. And I worked with local hospitals on how to set up more responsive programs. So it was a very community-driven program. I got to train at the Academy of Justice for Law Enforcement and be very involved in helping make the legislation hit the ground in terms of informing victims of their resources and also in terms of holding individuals who have been violent accountable for their behavior, even if the victim doesn't want that to happen. At that point, I got really tired of people asking me first, well, what are your credentials? Because 
everybody has a different measure of when they think you constitute a credible source of information. And a lot of the professionals that I was interacting with um, wanted me to have some kind of degree. That was more than my bachelor's. Ideally, wanted me to be licensed. And if I wasn't the, those things, that became one thing for some people that allowed them to disregard what I was learning or what I had been told from all the people I had worked with. So at that point, I decided to go to graduate school. And I went to Cal State San Bernardino, and I did their counseling psychology program. And I loved it. And I graduated and decided that I hated psychology and I was never again going to have anything to do with psychology <laughs> because I felt like I'd listened to two years of pathology. Here's everything that can be wrong with people. Here's all the ways that you can diagnostically categorize that. Here's the recipe for how you fix them. And here's what normal, typical mental health looks like. And if people fall outside of that realm, they're sick. Um, and nothing about that fit my value system, and I didn't see another way to do work in our system. So I ended up actually moving north to Santa Cruz, because I had ended up back south. And I initially started working for Big Brothers Big Sisters of Santa Cruz. And that was an amazing experience, too. So as you can see, even before I had a license, there were a lot of different kinds of opportunities to work on system change, individual change, to work in community environments. Then I ended up deciding to go to work for um, Adult and Children's Mental Health Services, County of Santa Cruz. So that opened a whole new chapter for me. While I was there, I got to be in a wilderness program for at-risk, gay-involved middle schoolers. So we went camping with them for three to four days at a time. The idea was if you can take people out into environments that are unfamiliar to them, and you can help them to experience themselves in ways that they've never experienced themselves before, and they can experience success, it opens up the ability for them to then consider that there may be other ways that they're capable of being in the world and other opportunities that they haven't recognized. So I got to do that. I also got to work in a Healthy Start program, both at an elementary and a middle school level. I got to do peer counseling, a parent empowerment project. I got to work with transition-aged youth, 14 to 22, who were either in jail or on the psych ward. And our job was to take them out of those environments, try to stabilize them in terms of their mental health symptoms, try to shelter them, and get them signed up for Social Security Disability. <coughs> and what I really got to learn is that a lot of families give up on their children. And I say that with no judgment whatsoever. But so many of the people that I interacted with were youth who had burned their bridges who wanted desperately to believe that they were okay, who would stay on their meds long enough to feel okay and then stop, and who had this experience of constantly bottoming out. So um, after that, I went and worked as a program coordinator for a local nonprofit doing collaborative community-based partnering with law enforcement and the local business communities to try to impact drug and alcohol use on high school campus. Then I worked as a senior administrative analyst. I decided my little heart was broken. Remember I said for you? I decided my little heart was broken from working with people who just seemed like they were consistently getting more than their share. And I wanted to do something about that. And I also really wanted to do something about the people doing the work because what I noticed when I was working in the county is that the only way I could really survive the experience was by telling myself, don't look for it to be logical, and don't get attached to any way that they're doing this, because a different program is going to come along next month or next year, and the whole scene is going to change again. So I wanted to write policy. I wanted to make the system make sense. This is really naive. And I thought, I'm going to do this as an analyst. So 
So I was an analyst, and during the time that I was doing that, I was trying to write from a client-centered, strength-based, culturally sensitive, inclusive, and transparent policy and procedure news, which meant I involved staff in writing all the procedures, which meant I would go out and find people who actually came to the programs and talk to them about what do you need from this program for it to really be meaningful to you. And I would try to write that kind of procedure. And then I was also involved with the UC Davis Domestic Violence Task Force, which was creating policy um, to look at what does best response look like. Then um, I moved up here from Santa Cruz because I couldn't buy a house because they have the big, huge computer Silicon Valley bubble thing. Um, and also because I thought, I know what the problem is. I'm in a community that's too large and there's too many players. And if I could be in a small and more intimate community where people can build relationships with each other and we can have conversation and work together on a collaborative approach, we can be more successful at helping the people who need our help. So I came to work at Mental Health up here. When I was up here, I worked for two years. I worked in the Repeat Offender Prevention Program for probation. I worked in the Alternative Response Team for Child Welfare. I worked on the Family Intervention Team, which is a multidisciplinary team. And I also developed Foster Family Support Services. I lasted two years, and I thought, OK, the county system isn't really a good fit for me. So I've done 10 years in the county at this point. What I loved about it was that I got every bit of support I needed in terms of training and evidence-based practice and all kinds of other yummy things to get licensed. And that was awesome. But I felt like I was missing something, so I decided I'm going to try something radically different. So I went to work for United Indian Health Services. And I loved it because I showed up there and the first thing that happened is they said, we don't really give a chance. What you know, what we really want to know is why are you here and do you care about what's really happening here in our community? And are you really prepared to think differently about how you're trying to serve people? Because here in this clinic and here in this agency, we believe it's about working with families, working with community, and really honoring the fact that we live in a context of the network from our planet, down to the tribe, down to our community, down to our families, and that healing has to happen in a holistic kind of way, physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, spiritually. We believe that everything has to be provided in a relational context. So I spent my first year there feeling so stupid, um, and I want to be really honest about that because it was one of my most profound experiences with what it is like to try to work from a different cultural lens. And even though I had had an opportunity to work with a lot of different cultural groups, I had not had an opp opportunity to work in Indian country yet, and that was a really different experience for me. I loved it. I would have stayed there. I actually did feel like I found a little bit of home there in terms of how we were doing the work. I also loved that in terms of the structure, the leadership was three people. It was me, and Teen, and Roy, both of whom were Native American. And all the staff, the mental health and the substance abuse staff, knew they could come to any one of the three of us. And that we were making decisions as a group and that none of our decisions were final until we had talked about it as a staff. And the understanding was also that no conversation was finished until it was finished. So it didn't matter if a meeting had been scheduled for an hour. If it took us three hours to get something settled, the expectation was we were going to do that. The grant ran out. So I had to figure out what to do next. Um, and, and then we go into the surreal part of my career. So I decided to go to Sacramento and read the plans that counties were submitting because Prop 63, the Mental Health Services Act, had passed. And the idea was, we're going to transform the public mental health system. 
So I went to read county plans, and due to a whole bunch of circumstances, I ended up being the governor appointed executive director for the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission for several years. So somehow I ended up doing state policy on one of the most highly political pieces of legislation that ever passed, working with stakeholder groups all across our state who had one story after another about how the public mental health system had failed. Um, so, that was interesting. That's another thing you can do with your degree, and that is another whole long story. After that, I worked at hospice, which is my heart's work. Then I came to work at the clinic. So, that is what you can do, being a psychology graduate and having a marriage and family therapist license. So there are not many limits, and that's only getting better. They just recently passed legislation that federally qualified rural health clinics like UIHS can now hire and bill with MFTs. It used to be just social workers. So that's really good news. And that trend is on par. There's legislation right now about trying to make LMFTs um, also eligible to be Medicare providers. Um, so I came out of all of this with three questions. Why do similar experiences affect some people in such different ways? What allows us to be more resilient? And what are we really trying to do in therapy? So what I decided in terms of why do similar experiences affect some people in such different ways is that there are certain skills and attitudes that are fundamental to whether or not we view an experience as threatening our physical or emotional survival. And the definition of trauma that I love best is any experience that we perceive as threatening our physical or emotional survival can be described as traumatic. So that was the first thing, is that not everybody views the same experience as a trauma. That was really good for me to realize. And then the second thing was, what allows us to be more resilient? What I came to understand about that is that our ability to regulate our emotion, to have a strong support network, and to stay glued to our own personal authenticity is fundamental to surviving whatever it is that's happening in our the third question was, what are we really trying to do in therapy? And more and more, I was starting to move away from what we're talking about in the room, although that's important. But I was becoming really intrigued with what we're feeling in a room with each other. So there were two skills in particular that really impact our physical, mental, emotional, social, and spiritual health over the course of a lifetime. The ability to experience our feelings, even the uncomfortable ones, and to know how to self-soothe and manage those feelings. And the other one is the ability to form positive relationships with people around us. And to minimize relationships with people who don't have our best interests at heart. So what I found out is that the foundation for those skills happens between the ages of zero to three. And I was like, wait a minute, because everybody told me zero to three was hands off if you were a therapist. Nobody's talking yet, so you can't do anything with like that. That was my training. We didn't see people at the county until they were five. If we were really progressive, it was three. The idea that I had a role at zero to three made no sense to me. Then I found out that 80% of our brain structure is in place by the time we're three. So we're setting our templates. Essentially, what we're doing is we are physiologically encoding in our bodies and our brain structure and our DNA what we're experiencing between zero to three. And during that time, we're setting our set point for hyperarousal, that fight, flight, freeze response is getting set. We're setting our relational templates. Can we trust people when we're in despair or distress? Is the world a safe place? All of that stuff is getting set in place at a time where I thought I had no role. And then I discovered infant family early childhood mental health. 
And that happened because I was involved in the Zero to Eight Mental Health Collaborative, which is a local collaborative. What I have learned as a survival mechanism in this profession is that when we work alone and when we isolate, we're no different from our clients who have a desire to separate and isolate because they've learned that's the only way to stay safe. It feels good. That contraction can feel good in the moment because we're reducing stem stimuli, but it's not helpful to us in the long run because we are social, relational animals. We are meant to be in proximity to each other. We have neuro-relational dynamics that happen in our nervous systems. We can literally sit as a calm, attuned, present person and help somebody else to feel less anxious, and we don't even have to open our mouth. That's the magic of what we're designed to do for each other. Um, Dr. Stephen Porges talks about this a lot in his polyvagal theory, um, and by all means, I would encourage you to read that and look at that and really look at some of this neuro-relational stuff. If I was smarter and had more time, I would be all over that. Because this, this neuro-relational stuff is amazing. Um, sure, Dr. Stephen Porges, P-O-R-G-E-S. Um, so as I was starting to understand everything that was happening at this early stage, I started to realize and to read about how there actually is a certification program now that exists in our state in infant family early childhood mental health. And I could have, should have, learned at UIHS, but of course I had a role. Because at zero to three, we're working with families. We're working with parents and caregivers and grandparents and whoever is having a relationship with an infant or a young child to learn how to self-regulate, to learn how to co-regulate their child, to learn how to form successful attachments, to learn how to recognize if there are developmental delays that need attention, to learn how to stimulate their child in ways so that rather than being focused on am I safe or not, and unwilling to go out into the world and, and explore, children are feeling the confidence to go out and test their limits and try new skills because they have a strong foundation. So more and more what is happening in the mental health field is that there is this approach of bringing mental health services and physical health services and substance abuse services all together. And those of us in the mental health world are being called upon to be sort of a lead in that team approach and to take a much more holistic lens. I would really encourage you to read Prop 63 of that Mental Health Services Act language because I did it because it blew my socks off, because it was talking about things like client-centered, strength-based, and family-driven, and culturally relevant, and utilizing a wraparound approach where you acknowledge the family. So by the time I started getting involved in the infant family work, I thought I had it. And then this epigenetic stuff comes along. And, and, um, and I found that totally intimidating. So here is the Sherry version of epigenetics, which is so ridiculously simplified, but what I'm hoping is that it might spark your curiosity. So this Sherry version of epigenetics, I'm reading it. <laughs> <laughs> Additional information, which is layered on top of the sequence of letters that makes up DNA. Any outside stimulus, this is the part that I'm so fascinated with, that can be detected by the body has the potential to cause epigenetic modifications. That includes things like chemical exposure, lifestyle factors, experiences including traumatic experiences, and these epigenetic modifications leave marks on our DNA. It's got proteins, interaction in the cell, scientific stuff, but that's the basic point. These different types of epigenetic marks tell, oh look, tell the proteins in our cells to process parts of DNA in certain ways. 
Even though every cell in our body starts off with the same DNA sequence, give or take a couple of letters here and there, there are some studies which seem to indicate that epigenetic marks can be inherited. Here's the reason I'm so interested. Me, grief, trauma, completely obsessed person trying to figure out how to save the world. For example, studies in Sweden and the Netherlands seem to suggest that nutrient deprivation in a recent ancestor seems to prime the body for diabetes and cardiovascular problems. Even more importantly, increasingly it looks like children whose parents and ancestors experience trauma may be physiologically less able to metabolize stress and thus predisposed to PTSD. So here I thought, when we start interacting with pregnant moms, we'd like hit the beginning of the cycle, but no. It goes back into the generation before and before and before. So at first I got really depressed, and then I got really, really excited. Because what I realized is that that works in both directions. Which means that if we can do intervention as early as possible, but whenever we do intervention, it's not just about what we're doing for that child or that family, but it is about epigenetic influences that we can be contributing to. And we may literally be helping the next generation that we will never even meet, or maybe we will, depending where we are, we can literally be helping them to come into the world as a more resilient human being. So, I think that's that. Um, so that was all I wrote. So what can we do? Oh, I guess I wrote two more things. <laughs> so what we can do is as we live and breathe and wander this universe and be professional and be personal and be in family and relationship and whatever, we can remember that what we feel in here is going out there. And even if the other person does not have any awareness of how we are impacting them, we are impacting them. That calls into a whole different level of accountability and responsibility for us to try to show up in a way that's not only for the best benefit of ourselves, but any bit of self-care we do also is going to show up in our every interaction with every other person. Which means, yes, you do get to argue for breaks and full lunch times and reasonable schedules and jobs that you can do and still have family and passion and hobbies and all that other stuff because you can't do one without the other. That's going to really matter to you a lot when you start working because a lot of people are going to tell you the way you prove your commitment to this work is you die at your desk. That you spend every second that you have energy left spending it. And I'm hoping that I'm making a case for don't do that. <laughs> the other thing is that I think we have fundamentally changed the question from when I was in graduate school. I do not think, and Dr. Perry is the one who says this, the question is no longer in mental health, what's wrong with you? The question is, what happened to you. And in the room, the question is no longer what are we going to do to that person, but how are we going to engage with that human being? And not just engage their mind, but how are we going to engage their physical presence in the room? Do you have any questions? That was a lot.